So I've been working sort of the DevSecOps space uh, for a little over 10 years, uh, actually with that. So I actually started on the beginning on the commercial side. We were actually uh, building something for the intelligence community where we did the 24 hour cycle where we were publishing unclassified developed software on the CIPRNet, on the JWIX, on the NSA net. Uh, not quite in that order, but it was an automated process to actually push through the uh, uh, the delivery for the entire piece um, with it. I worked that for a couple of years. We had, um, you know, the software team that I was working with, it was at a software company, you know, so I was brought into, um, you know, to DevSecOps from the developers uh, on that side of things. There was a small government team that was sort of out doing the sales pitch of this great DevOps uh, stuff across the Intel community um, member at that time. And, you know, but it allowed us to kind of, you know, let the developers really build pipelines, you know, build what needed to be put in place to actually provide that uh, that 24 hour uh, return cycle, uh, testing different things with it. Um, fast forward a couple of years, I, I did a stint as a reservist over in Afghanistan for a year. And when I came back uh, from that, uh, the project that I had been working on, um, the contract transition with it. Uh, so I was kind of shopping through jobs on, um, you, you know, what the Navy was looking for. Uh, and PEO IWS came up, uh, you know, which a program office that actually, you know, puts the weapon systems and sensor systems out on the uh, on the surface ships with it. Um, they were asking for somebody to come in and hey, we want to bring somebody on for a year to look at data analytics. It's like, well, that's kind of in my wheelhouse. Uh, went in and talked with the SES at that time, um, really found out it wasn't necessarily data analytics that they wanted to get to, but what they wanted to look at was, hey, how can I deliver capability faster out to the to the fleet? Um, said, okay, I, you know, data might be you know a part of that, but as we started digging into the problem case that we had, um, what we actually found is the way that we deploy capability is a computer infrastructure is put together for an architecture uh, with it. This takes about two years that they go back and forth on this. Uh, then an RFP is pushed out, then a contract is laid for that, and then we do a lifetime buy of that equipment. So we've got about an eight-year time frame between putting the first install on ship from when we designed it, and then we keep it out in the fleet for 12 years. So automatically we are, before we even put something on a ship, there's already obsolete components that we're dealing with before we get to the start. Then the software layer, uh, when we took a look at this, uh, the way that they deploy software capability is it is hard coded down into that infrastructure and all of the racks with the software preloaded are taken down to the pier. They cut a hole in the ship and they crane it in place with that. So our change process on what we can actually do with that tightly coupled software and hardware and just the time frames of what we're doing for updating. Um, you know, obviously you can kind of match what that means for your update cycle with it. So it was like, okay, if you want to deploy capability faster, there really are some changes we can make, you know, first in adaptability of how we lay out the, the infrastructure layer, and then in how we change the, you know, looking at the software. And so, you know, I started bringing up some things at this point in time, hey, you know, commercial world has gone down this path of continuous integration and in their development and different things. SES that I was working for, super aggressive, you know, oh, this is great. This is exactly what we want to do, shake up the Navy um, type piece with it. Um, how many of you work primarily within the government uh, space and, and have worked customers? Okay. So uh, how many of you heard the word from your customer of, you know, DevOps or DevSecOps before, you know, four years ago? Okay. I, and maybe kicking around as a buzzword uh, with it. Um, we worked with you four years ago. So. Uh, yeah. So we're okay. <laughs> Yes, uh, you guys uh, did hear me uh, start to spot that. Um, yeah, so what we sort of ran into with this is, you know, we had senior level management that was like, this is great. There was a project out of uh, um, C4I at that time and an Admiral uh, Barrett out there who was pushing this and compiled a Combat 24 and we can do all of these things uh, with it. Um, and, and they were starting to do some small level experimentation and demonstration uh, with that. And it was really, we were able to kind of leverage the egg that they got on their, you know, everybody, all the antibodies came out. It's like, oh my God, we can't do this. You know, we, it takes us two years to do updates and whatnot. You know, a lot of the initial salvos and shots got fired over in the C4I direction. So we greatly appreciate, you know, Navor Spayware at that time taking the uh, taking the hit for us. Um, but what it kind of enabled us to do is it started that conversation across 
okay, you know, software can be developed faster. I do need to get some abstraction from my hardware and there's, there's things that we need to do for that. Um, but what we actually found and where this is kind of pertinent to the, uh, to the group here in the conversation today is in order to put us on a pathway that even allowed the conversation of being able to do this, we had to start about five and a half years ago with a massive education start. Um, because, you know, as we looked at the primarily the, uh, the people that were in the program office and at our worker centers who were providing, you know, the technical design uh, advisement and whatnot, this had never existed in their experience. You know, it, it, this is guys anywhere from like five to 45 years of, you know, either fleet experience or experience delivering in this way of I go make hole cuts and I put this stuff on and I've got my next 10 years worth of servers sitting in the uh, the warehouse so I know you know exactly how to roll those out and update them. And so explaining to people that are used to running at that pace that now we we really can update software and you know almost immediately there's no huge danger for me putting you know necessarily that uh, that user on a keyboard and making you know changes. I had fortunately just come from uh, well Fortunately or unfortunately, just come from Afghanistan uh, prior to that. And, you know, we have these seaway systems that actually sit there and protect kind of the bases. And so, you know, it, theoretically, anytime a mortar is fired, you know, it'll automatically queue and it'll shoot it down. Well, occasionally you'd hit a flock of birds <laughs> and it would queue as a mortar. Occasionally they'd come in at an angle that, uh, that it didn't quite catch and, you know, mortar goes skidding across uh, the base, but they would immediately make the algorithm changes to adjust for that. So, you know, on the fly, weapon system, because this was a big part of the argument that we had coming from the safety communities, whatnot. You know, this is this is a weapon system. It fires weapons. You know, you can't touch it. We've got to go through all this massive rigor and all the different things. So it, it you know, a big struggle to kind of get them to understand the realm of the possible that was sort of helping, you know, working in the commercial space. So we spent a lot of time in the first couple of years actually coordinating, you know, with Amazon Web Services, Microsoft, anybody that had big BD budgets uh, that we could actually, that we're happy to kind of give presentations on things, cycling our people through um, with it. Um, small companies at that point in time, Pivotal was doing work with uh, uh, with the Air Force and they were doing, you know, the Air Force kind of got ahead of uh, some of the other services and working this, um, doing peer programming and whatnot. You know, they have a DC office. We cycled a lot of our people through there. Um, got them down to Microsoft's uh, data center in South Hill to actually see, you know, Microsoft managing hundreds of acres of, uh, you know, computers and, you know, we can't even manage 12 racks on a single ship uh, with it. And, and they're doing that with almost no employees whatsoever on that site, everything being kind of remotely managed. So, but it was kind of slow world to start to show, hey, you know, this stuff is real. If it's not science fiction, it is mature commercially <laughs> and then looking to bring it in place. Um, the, the project that I kind of had referenced in the uh, the bio uh, coming into this, you know, we knew that in order to get, get, we got a lot of people out there and they're like, oh, this is great, this is cool, but it's, you know, it's not a ship. So we were going to need to actually be able to draw that next connection to show. Now, we, we can get it on a ship um, with that. So we ran the project, um, the USS Monterey, which at the time was the oldest cruiser in the, uh, the fleet. It was a very last baseline three Aegis. Uh, and I, I really can't put this into perspective. I, well, if you've seen a 1950s sci-fi movie, you know, where they were trying to project in the future and you had, um, you know, computer systems and walls of things and early, you know, the Star green, Trek. Or early Star Trek, but maybe not even quite that advanced in some cases. Uh, th this was the, you know, that's a computer system on this, uh, uh, on the ship. Um, literally at the time, my phone had more storage and processing power than what was in, you know, the entire piece. But this is what, you know, we ran the combat system up with. No network in place. Um, looking back after the project, we were like, we never would have <laughs> accepted the project for this ship if, uh, if we had. Um, but it, it actually gave a really good story. We were able to use some prototype contracts. We were able to bring in and replace things, um, you know, very quickly. Go to industry, say, hey, give me a four rack, you know cloud native service, infrastructure service stack. Uh, we're gonna run you know, some new applications on, and we're gonna demonstrate that a ship during deployment can actually get over the air updates, something that's never been done for uh, you know, the combat system side. I mean, we're lucky if we update in three or four years, let alone you know, something during a deployment, not with it. Um, 
had to do whole way up through CNO and Fleet Forces Command. So, I mean, as high as you could go to actually get this approved and remove hurdles and, and hiccups to kind of uh, uh, get the demonstrator in place. But once all was said and done, we did get it on deployment. Um, didn't touch the fire control loop of it, but it was really because it, it was these Yuck 43 systems. I don't know if anybody's familiar. No boys. Uh, was it? What's that? Were they sevens or 43? 43s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You got 43 low boys on it, and you know everything was run with Navy specific cabling that didn't exist anywhere. And, and tearing it out, we'd have to lay a whole new network and everything. So it's like, we'll leave the fire control loop. We replaced the large screen display, which was this old um, projector display that there were only three created in the world in 1980. It was the cutting edge. There is now one in the Smithsonian. There is that one. But the bulbs, when they burn out, they were the only user in the entire world, and they were $63,000 a bulb. So, yeah. So the, the ship was very keen on, oh, yeah, if you can upgrade something, you know, on our entire video wall, it, you know, didn't cost much more than what they were getting, at, um, uh, you know, for the bulbs. Uh, but we were able to replace that out, put a lot of new technologies and demonstrators on there. Uh, but the big thing was with laying that, you know, the IAS layer in place, getting them out to sea. We did send a ship router because we didn't, you know, the compressed time frame that we did this, we didn't get through all the ship's training. And then we ran this over COVID. Um, with it. Um, they got out to see, we were able to do actually the first update that we had planned was a GUI update, but there ended up being a zero day uh, within VMware vCenter. So we got the extra ping of being able to actually fix a cyber uh, vulnerability over the air. Uh, that kind of gave some extra coattails to ride for the uh, for the project piece and then, you know, settled some other things in place. So had this demonstrator coming in um, that allowed us to kind of within POIWS say, it can be done now how do we scale it to enterprise uh, with it um this got us going from the fact of being able to stand up a you know a software factory to be able to provide you know combat system software to this you know it's okay you proved out for me that you could actually i can have a hardware stack i can put software on top of it i can update that software and you know we, we saw it work through deployment uh, so now the uh, the big transition that we're in, and this kind of coming up to real time with the program office is there is a program of record. You know, some of you have probably heard of Aegis or the ship itself, the SSDS uh, with it. Um, those two programs will be refactored, re architected into one kind of common core uh, integrated combat system. Um, that will happen as we roll through a contract cycle here uh, in the next month. So there will for those of you who live in this world, there will be a baseline nine and a baseline 10 of Aegis, and then that will be no more, and there will be ICS, and there will be SSDS, ACB 13 or 14, and then that will be the end, and it will be, you know, ICS uh, with it in a continuous integration truck. Um, all right, so let me back up now to, to some of the standard uh, pieces that we've got. So going through this in, in both of these scenarios from where I started within the Intel community and then coming into to NAPC, um, there are a couple of very, very big issues sort of related to standardization that uh, that, that come into play. There is, an, and right as I came in, I heard the conversation kind of go in that, uh, you know, there's, there's different languages that we speak in IT land versus, you know, the operational world versus, um, you know, program managers versus the contracting folks. And it may seem like we're all speaking English, but I have watched more conversations where folks from those communities sit in the same room and using the same words, all thinking they're understanding the conversation and they are completely talking past each other uh, with that. And it happens more often than you can possibly imagine. You probably fit in one of those four realms with it, um, but it becomes really significant. Um, you know, the gentleman that was up here, I saw was coming in mentioned, you know, our contracting folks don't generally understand IT. It's really true, but they are the people that actually evaluate and bring vendors and support folks in, or they will buy licenses or contracts for the tools that we end up using. And they don't really understand how any of it works. Um, the other huge issue that we had, and, and this was kind of a double-edged sword for us, you know, early on in the program, I didn't have any money, so I was using BD money from anybody under the sun to kind of, you know, start some education pieces with folks. Now, coming with that is the risk of, you know, 
they use marketing language for for capabilities. <laughs> um, and, and how many of you guys are from industry? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, we purposely do this. <laughs> when you're sitting on that side, you've got to have some differentiator for yourself to try and sell to your customer. You know, for what you're doing or that you know that value that uh, that you're kind of bringing. Sell the you sell the pig. Yeah. So DevOps becomes a really interesting space uh, when we start getting this, especially like if we look at just the continuous integration side. You know, if I dated back to, you know, Pivotal had, you know, sort of its uh, stack of things. There were a handful of other customers at that time that were offering, hey, we can stand up the DevOps environment. We've got this DevOps in a box. All of it was really based off of, you know, 80% of the same open source tools that, that were kind of pulled together with this. But as you were talking to program managers or contracting folks or different things, you know, with this, they didn't know enough to be able to differentiate any of those things. Um, you know, and, and this has probably been the biggest struggle and in, in kind of where we're at right now, especially um, our program office got hit them to funding this year. So all of a sudden, you know, we, we weren't quite a real boy until you get your, your money from, you know, from not have the, you know, for your program. Oh, it's like, okay, now, you know, everybody comes out of the woodwork. Yeah, you know, people were watching for a while. There was, you know, reach back from industry and it's like, okay, yeah, we'll keep an eye on this one. But, you know, the moment that money drops, then, uh, you know, the phone calls are starting to come in. Hey, we can fix this for you. We can do this. You know, we're, we're ready to go for yeah, you next year. Uh, right. I, I mean, I did it. <laughs> when I was sitting on this, I mean, that's what you're tracking um, with it. Um, but the difficulty is, you know, how do... How does that program manager or who even parses it down to as this government PAPMs and or the contracting folks differentiate what it is they should buy to help them come forward? Um, now, we did, we, we've got basically IWSX has taken over the transition of the, there was a CSEA contract that was kind of in place, uh, combat system um, AG contract for how we did it just before. We're transitioning that into a systems and engineering system integration contract. Subtle changes in that is that really the coming into the new contract cycle, the government is going to direct where development work is actually going to be happening. Um, so we're actually transitioning. It's like we may pay somebody else to manage the environment, but we will own the environment, provision it, and you know, give us a little bit more ability to feed the requirements in place. Um, the second piece that kind of worked in this transition is uh, doing that allowed us to basically open the space for other developers to be able to come in and, and leverage the ecosystem. Whereas primarily, I, I mean, I don't know how many of you are from big integrators, but if I was a big integrator and I want a contract, you know, I would run this on-prem, you know, I had the steady state of like, you know, seats for access in my environment, you know, the different things I could run on the contract. But if I am another big integrator vendor, I'm not necessarily gonna wanna participate in a project where my development is gonna sit in an environment run by that other integrator. And, and not, you know, even if you were very close and you had good partnerships, there's just that natural, you know, I'm giving stuff that I would, you know, may not even be IP, but it's, my effort and different things that I could potentially sell elsewhere, you know, into an environment where it's going to be managed, maintained, and run by somebody else, or the good ideas from my developers they're going to feed into it. Part of our big goal of doing this transition is to hopefully, you know, free that up. Plus, there is a core. Um, we tried early on in the project to go out to venture capital. You know, there are a handful of things for combat management system to see if, you know, any, anybody would be willing to kind of provide money into that construct. Um, Oddly enough, there's not a lot of people that see value in the commercial innovation of a combat management system. The, I, the ROI might not be there. Uh, it, it, it does seem that they did not see where they could sell that uh, a bunch outside where we would allow them to sell it um, kind of with the other partnerships we had. So looking at that and that application piece, it's sort of like, well, okay, if it doesn't really have commercialization potential, why don't we as the government, you know, let's build and own that piece with a little bit tighter control and then we'll just allow you know sensor and weapons and you know the different pieces that could be plugged into that coming from industry um but i'll circle back kind of to the to the standardization piece uh with it because going through this process and as we started you know hitting this in place it, it really came down to those engagements not only with uh industry coming in and trying to sell ideas and, and a lot of times 
it was the same ideas, but just marketed or packaged differently. And then the second thing is we start getting, you know, there's accreditation, there's certification flows that you have to go through. And, you know, with DevOps and continuous integration, all of a sudden we're presenting to our accrediting body that's like, hey, you're going to get all this OQE coming out of your uh, software work. These guys had never had this before. And they really, you know, there was just a lot of hand waving around software of, okay, you know, the vendor provided this, they did all this smoke testing, it works. They were really more interested in the mission thread testing of I push a button, it fires a missile. Most of the time I hit what I'm shooting at. If not, you know, they went back and they did some magic math and, you know, the next time I fire, I can hit it. But the actual practical coding that underlined that and or, you know, how fragile we force the vendor to make it based on, you know, 20 years of telling them we want new capability, but never wanting to fund taking care of tech debt. I, yep, which we do over and over again. I, I mean, inevitably, you know, you grow something that just becomes, you know, very fragile over time with it. But there was never any visibility on that in the government. So, you know, really, as we start exposing some of these things and, you know, having to walk our folks back from, you know, oh, my God, this vendor is horrible. You know, how could they do that? It's like, well, no, they didn't. You government did that by the way that you, you know, you wrote the contracts, the way you funded them and the fact that you never paid for them to go back and fix it. I mean, 20 years ago, yeah, think about what your phone looked like 20 years ago, 25 years ago, you know, when some of this started. It's a little bit different, you know, from world than we're today. There was no Netflix. There was no, you know, streaming TV, you know, different things. Just technology's changed pretty significantly from where we started at that point in time. Um, but yeah, so accreditation community, certification community is kind of the other one for us, you know, just getting them to understand they were used to two to six year cycles of, of new things coming out to the fleet um, with it, you know, so telling them now that potentially we could send them an update in 24 hours and, and work that through, it just, it, it blows them. They don't know how to deal with it in the processes, training community. So when I have a baseline that only comes out every two years, it's very easy for me to spend a year building the training content that I will then go have a, you know, a four month class with the next, you know, group of guys coming through or, you know, 10 years to 12 years for an entire baseline. It's just tweaks, you know, with that. But if we're telling them that, hey, you could get updates in 60 or 90 days with it, they don't know how to kind of adapt, you know, their training process. Now, I watch my kids, one of who's in college and one of who's in high school now. I mean, they can pick up a new video game that is more complex in a lot of ways than what our combat systems are for what they do. They can start playing and, you know, it will either walk them through the rules of how to do it or, you know, it's got things, you know, they, they pick it up within hours. I have to keep reminding folks, you know, and especially those that, you know, my age, a little bit older that have been around, you know, they were fire patrolmen back in the day or whatnot, that these are the kids that were bringing in as sailors today or airmen or, or different things. I mean, it's it's just, it's a very different generation. The generation never grew up without cell phones and, and different, you know, instant access to information, you know, that ability to watch videos, to look at things as opposed to read. Um, these are all the things that we've kind of got to make sure that we take into consideration as we're, you know, looking at standardization. I, I mean, it's education to our community. It's, there has to be a business case. I mean, if we wanted to come in and say, I want to standardize down to specific tools and everything, well, that kills a portion of your market. Right? I mean, it's, it's not something that you're going to end up with multiple body parts jumping up. Selection. It's, I, and yes, <clears throat> yeah. But I liked where the conversation was going and sort of um, looking at how things were laid out initially of there are processes across that continuous integration and continuous delivery cycle that had five years ago or six years ago, I had some definitions laid out that I could have used as the steady state to, you know, to start to get people to understand things the same way as we were doing the dog and pony shows and the education pieces, it would have actually, I, I would be a lot further ahead right now than, than what we are because of, you know, having people educated by different folks that had either used different languages or marketing bend or, or, or different things at, uh, at that time. So, yeah. A little bit of a story about some of the history, some of the problems we ran into, and, and and sort of my thoughts on yes, I think this is a very good thing to start, you know, looking at settling down in some language uh, that we can all get behind with it. Um, but I will pause there and give time for questions to anybody that uh, that may have. 
Did I hear correctly that the government is actually getting behind? We need to provide source control, build system, infrastructure as a service as a capability that they offer to projects that are doing development in different areas because I thought it was going the opposite direction with like DI2E shutting down. Uh, so, yes. Um, well, so let me ask this. Uh, um, what, what service do you support? Uh, Navy primarily. Navy primarily. Okay. So, yes. So, there are a couple of different options that, uh, that you've got on where to go to. Uh, within Navboard channels, they've had the overmatch software over, you know, that has stood this up in a neighborhood. Right. Um, PEO Digital has Black Pearl, uh, and which is actually what we're leveraging for the IL-5 side. Okay. And then out of NSERC, they have IL-5 and IL-6 uh, available. We've done a lot of our experimentation there. Uh, the big, all of those environments are expanding. Is that for dev as well as deployment? Uh, well, so, so this is where it really depends on what your deployment scenario is. Sure. So for us, our deployment goes to a ship. So everything prior to going to that ship is development. So for me, that talk about production cloud versus development cloud, it means nothing to me. I, I don't care. I, I mean, I'm going to go find whichever one has the best SLA and the best sport boats, which to date the answer guys have been pretty fantastic for us um, to work with. Um, but yeah, so, so there's multiple options. Each of the other services has uh, similar options, you know, available to them. Um, Cross pollination has been difficult just because of the fact that reciprocity, you know, 20 plus years later, we still haven't managed to make that work well. Uh, though, you know, hopefully we'll kind of get there as we start to hammer, you know, across the DOD. I mean, this, another place this group could, you know, kind of help as you standardize what those requirements are across your continuous integration, continuous delivery, you know, potentially further outstream deployment cycles. You know, what is the minimum OQE required to pass this? Uh, you know, what, you know, I may not care about a particular tool that I'm using, but all of those tools with particular steps will provide me, you know, I, I can configure what it is that it's looking at in there. You know, is there a bare minimum at, you know, what controls or what percentage? You know, those types of things are all helpful and kind of push this sure. forward. What other uh, questions? So what, what, what's your vision for kind of co-location versus distributed development? Obviously, we've got a lot more distributed. And, and then related question, if you are distributed, you kind of have to move things across environments. Like what, what in your idea should that look like? Yeah, so we, we actually approached this project. Um, and as we were molding things forward with the concept of, I want to be able to geographically disperse my entire team. Uh, you know, a big part of this and the selling piece that I, I kind of gave to, you know, the contract folks might not is developers in D.C. have a very different labor rate than developers in North Dakota. Or if I can open up, you know, a much broader play space, it's a bigger competitive area, I, I, I can potentially kind of lower rates. The problem is, you know, the infrastructure to actually provide that. So um, where we're moving and I've kind of kept the light in both camps with the major players with it. Uh, we've got some work that's happening in IL-6 Amazon Web Services. I've got some work in IL-6 Azure uh, with it. And I have regular meetings with both Amazon and Microsoft and they both know that I do it, but I play them against each other to see who's going to get me, you know, capability at a faster pace uh, on some of that. Um, ideally, what I do intend though is because Right now, my IL-5 development work is primarily happening in Black Pearl, which is running on Amazon Web Services. And primarily, my IL-6 work is happening in Azure um, within the NSERC environment with it. It's not a clean, you know, my ability to get one pipeline flow that actually allows me to do my on-class development, push it up, do any additional configuration, or get any secret breaks in that model. I've asked the Black Pearl team to add Microsoft to their <laughs> environment um, and then they will take the responsibility of taking my artifacts pushing them over into blob store and then we're working through with microsoft to use the diode to feed up on that side um, and then ultimately i've got another small project where we're you know working to come up through the diode il5 il6 within amazon but my goal is by 25 time frame that we will probably settle into one 
in, it's just going to be more cohesive for us to kind of lean in some of those uh, directions. What, what was the timeline by who originally started this? What was the timeline when we were setting up the ship for uh, when you had the technologies uh, and then number of months before you were ready for your uh, scans and approval, documentation and scans complete versus when you got approved? Yes. Yes, yeah, so with the uh, the project that we did on the Monterey, uh, with it, um, 2018, I spent about eight months actually getting us set up with uh, contracting mechanisms to be able to run OTAs. So we ended up actually partnering with uh, Mark Horse Syscom, who had a um, an OTA with a consortium management group, uh, which many of you are probably familiar with. Um, large selection of IT, non-traditional stuff and things with it. Um, and I had had some experience with them in the past, so I knew you know, how quickly they could go on certain things. Uh, we did an industry day in September of 2018 uh, with it to let industry know kind of what we were going to look to do through this project. You know, so it was kind of high in the sky. Hey, we're going to do this over the air update out the ships. We're going to change the infrastructure on ships. We're going to provide telemetry feedback. You know, it's going to have it's going to run a cloud inheritance model. Uh, we had about 400 people show up to that. About 380 of them probably thought we were crazy when we were going through, but there. There were some good questions and different things uh, with that that kind of helped us feedback. In December of that year, we did um, three statements of need, um, very short, that, that were kind of sent out, and they were published between December and January. Um, one of them was actually to bring in some expertise from industry to, you know, DevSec, uh, help us set up a DevSecOps uh, environment. We set them up on NSERC and they just kind of went down and did demos and different things to sort of help just educate IWS on what this was. It was in preparation for others. But the two significant ones were we did one additional um, statement of need to for a change out for the large screen displays uh, on the ship that we knew we were going to have. And we we bundled that with uh, console you know design changes uh, that we had. Um, and then the third one was Basically, a statement of need that said, hey, I need a four rack um, uh, infrastructure as a service system that I can get single pane of glass management. And there was a little bit more of that, but there wasn't much more. And then we pushed it out to industry, gave them 10 days to respond uh, and got White Rivers back. Um, we awarded two awards off the uh, a separate for the company to the consoles and the large screen displays, uh, split into two awards with it. We awarded those in April. Of that year, so we did the evaluation, had the team and everything in, in four months, got the contract aligned. And in 2018 or 20. Uh, so December of 2018, we in, in January of 2019, we published the statements made, awarded the contracts in April of 2019 and May of 2019 for uh, the infrastructure as a service piece. Right. We had the infrastructure as a service at Dahlgren uh, because by this point in time. We got through all of the wickets and you know got all the flags agreeing that yeah we'll you know wave some things to to let this happen for an experimentation except for one one star down at the piers of like you're not putting anything on my damn ship unless I can see it physically first so we had to actually build it out down at Dahlgren um, you know brought the racks down there stood everything up brought the large screen displays in got everything kind of unworked so that they could do some dog and pony shows that happened between August and November. Then of uh, 2019. Um, in parallel, from about August timeframe forward, there was a software development project they had of, out of uh, um, Dahlgren uh, that was already kind of agile-ish developed at that point in time. They kind of matured and launched to be able to show that they could do updates. It was the display software that we used for kind of the enhanced situational awareness. Um, they continued iterating on that as we get COVID the next year. Uh, they got to a point they were doing monthly builds, running it through an MFR with certification, and whether good or bad, a COVID happening and forcing everybody online. I, I mean, they did all of their certifications fully. Uh, you know, everything was kind of published in Jira. They could do the requirements traceability. They could show you know diagrams. They could walk through what changed and different things. And they did consistent through COVID with all the problems getting on ships, different things with it. Every 30 days uh, through that. Um, when did you get your ATO? Uh, so we worked out with security because um, I, I won't go into 
the security state of our current system. <laughs> With that, I learned to say they're not great, but we may have some uh, security through obscurity, uh, and because nobody could possibly imagine that's how we deploy things. Um, <laughs> But we were bringing in so many games with the new systems and the, the control management plane and some of the firewall changes, what we can do with software to find network. I mean, it was really, because we were bringing so much forward leaning stuff in place and just our, our bare minimum security construct and what we were able to demonstrate with it. We did a car, uh, so it, like a compressed, you know, basically they followed the wire diagram said, okay, you know, it's, Got a closed boundary. We want to actually see how all the stuff kind of performs and what you can do uh, with this. So it, it, it was compressed at, at that point in time. So we're actually still in the process now. That, you know that infrastructure set is similar to what we're going to be rolling out to the ships here in 26 when we start uh, picking up. Uh, but we're we're building out the controls pack to kind of finalizing that now uh, with it. But based off of what we got approved at that point. Uh, but yeah, then it went on uh, deployment. Um, Either November or December, uh, right there, and return in April of 21, April, May of 21, uh, with it. So, yeah, so from the time that we did the statement of, well, I, from the time that we did Industry Day and let industry know, that was September of 2018, it was all on a ship and deploying by the beginning of 21 uh, with that. So, yeah, significantly, I mean, brand new design. New technology rolled out onto the ship in less time than we generally take to design a new hardware stack I, with all the contracts and everything put in place. So amazing things can happen. We did have to use the four star hammer a couple of times. <laughs> Fleet Force's command of, uh, yeah, I'm ready. Uh, we need to remove this little hurdle here uh, with it. Um, but huge success. And it, like I said, I mean, it's driven a program office stand up. Um, it, drove something that got into PITM2 funding, you know, out of a year early uh, because they see the value of, you know, being able to change some of these things out and give us more adaptable uh, nature with it. So 